<laughs> Welcome to How They Got Hacked, Episode 3. Three! Yay! Three. We're getting consistent now. <laughs> yes, consistency. Tom Lawrence. Xavier D. Johnson. Maurice Nash. All right. And uh, we got some stories. We're going to jump into Sophos AWS Destroyed. Uh, well, no, no. I'm sorry. I wrote the, I, that's what I wrote. That's not what it actually happened, though. Let's let's break the story. <laughs> okay, it's so, end so, of the day. So let's so let's break this down. Right? We should record earlier when I'm more awake. <laughs> this would be really interesting if that was the title of this story, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like okay, let me let me think about this. Sophos, a UTM maker, mm-hmm. got really angry with uh, AWS and just decided, well, we're just going to destroy them, like yeah. the entire AWS, <laughs> <laughs> which is not at all what happened. Nope, not at all. I, well, that'd be interesting to cover. Um, this is almost as interesting to cover. Uh, there's a guy um, back in the UK who was working for a digital agency. Um, What's the name of this agency? Uh, I can't think of it right at this very second. Uh, uh, Vuva, Vuva, V-O-O-V-A. And uh, basically, this guy got laid off for not doing a good job, 36-year-old. Um, and what he did was just insidious. He... Stole one of his colleagues' uh, uh, credentials to their AWS, logged in, and terminated. Not turned off, terminated, which means it actually deleted the data that was associated with it. 23 servers. 23 servers at a digital agency. That's a lot of information. Wow. That's tons of information. Yeah. Wow. Uh, And this is bad. This is not something that... um, should have happened. And this is, but it does. And this is not the first time something like this has happened either. So, uh, there's a story that we were just talking about before, and I couldn't find the link to it. it. Happened several years ago, but the guy left the bank, and he was letting. They let him know, I guess, he was going to get fired, but then didn't actually fire him for a couple of days. So he took that opportunity to purge backups and purge data from it's the cl- bank, cleaning up after <laughs> himself, of course. Yeah. So, in this is one of those security hygiene things. You know, we're going to throw that word out there again. Um, when you get rid of one of these developers for whatever reason, you should also at the same time be like going through all the other people, auditing them and saying, hey, who else has access and uh, you know, who else should we change your password credentials? Because he might have looked over his shoulder sure, if they share credentials. And I, I know you can beat people over the head, don't share credentials. But, hey, maybe he had this in his plan. Maybe that was something he did all the time. He went and looked over and had a credential key, had an API key that you'd produced that was for another dev team within there that he's working with. So those are, those are like, some of those pitfalls that can happen. And, I mean, let's be honest, right? Like, I'll be completely blunt here. I'm certified from AWS two times. I have two certifications. One of them is a specialty in security. You need to have 2FA enabled. And if you don't have 2FA enabled... You need to have a policy assigned to all of your users yes. that says MFA present bull equals true. You want to always make sure that any action that takes place, a, a, a MFA session is is enabled. Um, that's the number one only way that you'll be able to get around this. I don't care if you shoulder, shoulder surfed and got the latest and greatest password of the CEO. If you had 2FA enabled, if you had a 2FA policy this would not have happened at all. And the CEO admits it. He comes out, uh, his name is Mark Bond, which, Bond, Mr. Bond. Bond. Mr. Yeah. Bond. <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting name. Um, but yeah, he, he's the CEO of Vuva, and he comes out and says, yeah, 2FA would have solved this. So even the CEO understands his right. security mishaps. So yeah, these are, ah, it, it, it happens a lot. So this is, it's unfortunate. And it happens a lot at these smaller places where they destroy. And even for some of the small businesses, we do sanitization when we've had staff leave and things like that. We got to run around changing passwords to everything. Yep. Instantly. Instantly. It's just part of the let go process. What do you think they had access to? We, we do auditing ourselves, like for anything. So we know what our staff has access and you hopefully have things like that are logging. So you know what that person may have been into because that'll give you an idea of what they could do. But you have to change the other adjacent working in that same team or just think about what they had access to right. what were they also working with other staff that they do some job in accounting well then maybe they have the accounting passwords too because they hung out a lot there cover all the bases 2fa all day every yep. day and and <laughs> i know of a company um of, a friend of mine actually told me about this uh, their security um contact for aws was a person who had already left the company oh So, um, you know, these types of things happen, especially in smaller environments. 
Um, luckily enough, from what I hear, the the person who uh, who had the, uh, the who got the phone call, who had left the company, was nice enough to pass the information along. But it, maybe he was disgruntled. Maybe he didn't have to. Right? You have to always have the what if. Uh, perspective. So I felt like that was a really interesting one to share, right? It was a super easy hack. Someone got credentials by all means and misused them. And of course, these permissions were over permissive because uh, no one at the company should be able to delete data uh, at all, right? We should have to have some kind of administrative process that allows us to go and talk to the systems administrator to actually write a policy that will allow you to delete or terminate instances, the worst thing you should be able to do is turn off an instance, right? So, um, especially in those smaller environments where, you know, this digital agency may have only been running 23 servers. Yeah. Right? They may have had a multi-tenant environment where they've had, you know, um, you know, a multitude of, of customers on each server. So, I, I find that to be disturbing, to say the least. Yeah. So, that's definitely uh, some of the takeaways from that. And I'm just... Clicking on that next story, as I get excited reading some of it, but the 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 steel company, oh the, boy, this poor company, man, they uh, this was a target, they they got hit, mm-hmm. and uh, what is this called? The Go logo, uh, locker locker go go yep. locker goga, mm-hmm. bad pronouncing. Sorry, end of the day, <laughs> so, <laughs> locker goga. So this is a really interesting malware that hit them, that crypto lockered everything. Mm-hmm. Now I. We're still getting the debrief on this, but it's making the news because this is not just some company. This is like, if I'm not mistaken, the largest aluminum provider in the world. They're global. And a U.S. office, if I understand all this, uh, it was opened at a U.S. office, but then spread across the network. That is tells me there's a couple flaws in their network. Like yeah. Maybe their network's a little flatter and less <laughs> siloed. Right. And this is the way the security should be working is the U.S. should be very locked down from the um, different markets, different uh, places they're in, from their home office, and each silo should not be able to infect the other. Yes. Well, this is really bad because it went across every network. And there's actually, I love it because I'll leave a link to the TechCrunch article. I don't know if you've seen this, but the um, they had a... Uh, <laughs> They put signs in the windows because it affected like down to the manufacturing, and it said, uh, "Hydro ER under cyber attack. Don't use computer till next week." <laughs> <laughs> it's like stickers in windows, like just don't use the computers. They're all offline. Everything's I wish offline. I can show you guys that picture. We will flip it. I'll flip it around and edit it in to show this under. But it's on the TechCrunch article. Wow. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely great. Uh, that's. So problematic, so problematic there. But once again, this is one of those things that if there's a debris from this, and I'm hoping we're getting some real good details here, this means they were not, um, they that lateral movement across the company. So you someone in the U.S. opens it up, you end up a lateral movement that spreads across all the sites. Now, not just sites. It went down because this uh, picture is at one of the factories, one of the production mm-hmm. uh, places for this. That means this went all the way across, which affects whether you're going to have in that, instance is the controllers uh, if you're not familiar with the way industrial control systems work uh, your SCADA controllers and things like that they're going to be internet enabled for monitoring we don't know if these were effective but they generally do their data logging across their network this is how we keep uh, checks on the steel production machines how much steel was made and things like that we deal with this in the automotive market and a lot of these controllers so when this gets shut down this is why they can't just well we'll just make it the manual process right. There isn't one anymore. These machines have to have data logging, and the data is not there anymore. So we don't know what's going in or what's coming out of the steel production. Uh, yeah, this is why you have to have all this so locked down. This is really, really bad. This is about as bad as it gets, especially when you think about um, the type of attack that happened. Right? This wasn't like something that was like a prey and spray. This seemed like it was something more methodical, right? Yeah. Yeah, it seemed very targeted because uh, where there's another link I found that I thought was really interesting is the uh, the ransomware they hit them with. They had uploaded a virus total, mm-hmm. and it looks like it passed all the, at that time, of course, there's a signature for it now because it's popular, but this is the problem with signature-based systems. And even Silence seemed to pass it, which also, if you're not familiar who Silence is, they seem to have a really innovative uh, machine learning slash AI mm-hmm. system. But one of the things I also want to know is what protections they had in place. But... It sounds like they probably were really good in security, really good on protections, but the other side of that is it still went through there, 
And as Xavier will tell you, if you develop something targeted for one company and we don't have a signature for it, what happens? It works. It works. 100% of the time. 100% of the time. And to be honest with you, um, you know, I've been on engagements where I've actually written my own malware to be able to attack the company. and Legally. And I, legally. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, well, everything. It's always legally, right? And uh, it's gotten caught by AV, even though I've written the code, right? So there are ways uh, that, you know, some of these uh, newer antivirus systems actually do know the framework in which you're coding in mm -hmm. and maybe be able to tell based on the behavior of, of the cause and how, the types of calls that you're making to the actual within the actual code that you're doing certain things, right? And that's when you go to the next level and maybe you start to write things at a lower level and not necessarily at a higher level programming language like C and you can start to control your logic flow a little bit different, maybe start to put in more garbage, mm -hmm. maybe start to move polymorphic um, there's there's a lot of different ways to be able to get around these uh, these these types of antiviruses. Right, that's why the signatures, like I said, are very, signatures are very reactive thing. The machine learning AI systems they have are behavior, but and we've dealt with this with uh, Huntress Labs. We have Huntress Labs watches for things added to startup, so he does have to get his uh, malware into some type of startup sequence. Always. Uh, which I did see. I, I, I haven't had a chance to read the proof of concept, but someone found a way to get things to start with PowerShell without instart being set up. So there's a new angles where they're that's memory persistent. That's interesting. Yeah, interesting. And because they realize that's the next level, okay, we're watching startup. But the way that works in how it's worked with us uh, working with Hunter Slabs is they will flag something that was added to startup as kind of like a yellow alert to let us know, hey, this is added to startup. We don't know what it is because we don't have a signature for it. And what it was is we have some transportation clients that use some unique software, custom written, that has a startup run. So they had no baseline for it, but they did let us know that something was added. Good news is we knew we added it, so we're good. Mm -hmm. So you need that human element. This is what like managed security service providers do is that add that human element for us to actively look at it and make a rational decision that we just can't get the machine learning to do to say, hey, this is now running in startup, so. Oh man, and I mean, you know, this is, I, I hate to, at the the risk of sounding like shameless plug guy here, um, I, this is the perfect opportunity for something like deception to come in your environment, right? We like to talk about ways to be able to solve this. One way is to install something like Hunter Slabs that looks for a change in behavior on the endpoint, but another way to do it is at the network level actually putting these decoys inside of your environment. Because when I move laterally, I'm looking for a domain, domain controller. Yeah, I'm trying to definitely. be the king of the castle. And if I land on a domain controller that's deceptive and I get in with credentials that seem correct, I'm now found. And I've been pushed into maybe a few other areas where deception has been enabled because these breadcrumbs are left. And I'm following these breadcrumbs, leaving forensics, Mm -hmm. um, I've already alerted the hunt team. They're watching my movements now. So uh, the, the, we're moving just as fast as the you know us blue teamers because I'm on the purple team. Us blue teamers are moving just as fast as the people on the red team, mm -hmm. mostly because we do have that purple team aspect. And, and this is and could get a little bit more elaborate. Is like putting honey pots on your network uh, are really important. I once you set up a honey pot that you know you put on a network, so nothing should ever touch it every alarm should go off when something touches it. Right. Like when you have something, you you know, you have something pretending to be an AD controller uh, that's just looking for active connections. So you see connections come to it, you're like, my user shouldn't know about this. Yep. That means someone's plucking through the network. Exactly. We talked about this in the last episode, These uh, that Guardian product that IBM makes where it looks like someone poking at the database, same concept where right. we're looking at the network security layer and going, something poked over here. And uh, I even even with a smaller network like we have, we use ARPWatch to even look for anything new added on to our DMZ right. network where our servers are, uh, or the secure network where the servers are, so we can notice any change, like anything on there that yep. is uh, alerts me to something happened that I need to know what. <laughs> Which my guys have given me a heart attack because they spun up, I have an old database server, <laughs> and I freaked out. I'm like, calling. they didn't answer the phone right away, and they needed, the reason why is because they're on the phone with a client, and I spun up our old database um, to get some old information out. Oh boy. <laughs> Man, it, I'm like, how did that thing get started up? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't think, I, yeah, yeah. My guys, my guys did it, so. So if you ever want to play, if you ever want to prank this guy, yeah. you just spin something up on his oh, network. Yeah. Have one of my guys, have one of my uh, staff, and without calling me first, let me know, and I told them they need to let me know, so. There you go. So in a kind of related note to watching it, did I talk about the the 
the end result. Actually, because you guys were here last time, and I don't think we got the end result. We didn't talk about it on the show. I don't think oh. at all of that. The, what was going on with the person pinging it? Oh, right. Yeah, we didn't yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. It. yeah. So yeah. someone wanted to reverse engineer something on my website, and mm-hmm. they wanted to see how we did the remote support. We have it embedded on our website. And then what set off all the flags is we got rate limiting, we got Sericata, we're watching stuff, and there was a bunch of page refreshes, nothing nefarious, but a bunch of page refreshes, which was enough to trigger a rate limit Mm -hmm. log. So I'm like, okay, why am I getting like 7,000 hits from one person? I reverse engineered it, it turned out to be an IT company. down in Florida. Hi, if you're watching, because he's he watches the YouTube channel. There's a relationship here. So, uh, super nice guy. Was confused why I was calling him, but then understood right away once I said who I was. You're the guy that I was watching your YouTube videos. I I seen your website, and I wanted to see how you did the embedding on that. Well, he handed off to his web developer who works there as well, and uh, she had put it in like some bookmark manager mm-hmm. that kept refreshing the page. Wow. It was kind of weird. He didn't know it did that. But I seen the logs of it refreshing the page because it was an iframe set to refresh because we do an iframe embed for this remote support. And it, that's what hit the flag. But he was impressed that he goes, he said something along the lines of, well, you don't talk security. You actually noticed that and found me. That's what he, I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> we see you. Yeah. <laughs> he made it easy. He had an SSL start with his name in it. So, you, you know, go, you know yeah. so you were able to, it wasn't real raw. I didn't, it wasn't that in depth. I'm it not wasn't that far in the reverse. Well, he didn't yeah. have to break anything. Yeah. Shodan IP oh, yeah. address. Oh, look, it's 443. Allegedly. Yeah. Co- yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, he was listening to Shodan. They had his, and they had his cert name right in there. So you'd Shodan host because from the command line. Uh, I, if you don't have a Shodan account, get one so you can use the command line way faster than looking at a website. Mm-hmm. So you can just grab the IPs, throw it in Shodan. Boom. I'm probably going to do a video about it just to show you how quick that works. It's actually really easy, cool. and you can script it. Um, pull the SSL cert, find the name of the SSL cert, find the company name, and give them a call. <laughs> it was easy because it was an IT company, so they had their phone number on there. So, like, once again, not real rocket science on my part. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that. wasn't like I spent a lot of time researching and finding someone, but it was so fun. Nice. Yeah. Well, good to know that you're watching. and uh, I'm always you know, watching. <laughs> we are uh, enjoying the traffic as it comes. Yeah, I'm sure someone by the time they watch this is then going to my website and figure out what I'm talking about. I'm going to get a bunch more hits, and I'm going to call those people too, maybe. Let's shut my website down for a day, man. Just, <laughs> I'm just going to go offline. I've got to go dark for a little while. <laughs> so we also read you guys' comments, and we have feedback. So you guys say, I don't talk enough. So here I bring you a story, a low-tech hack with major repercussions. Oh. Uh, this story first um, broke in 2017. Google and Facebook were scammed out of $123 million by a man <laughs> posing as a hardware vendor. <laughs> a 50-year-old Lithuanian man um, set up a company with the same name as a company that Facebook and Google have been using and then uh, proceeded to send emails to them posing as said company and asked for $123 million, and they sent it quickly. They thought it was the other company. Because what's a hundred million when you're trying to buy servers? <laughs> Just <laughs> I can't believe that companies that large still don't have um, don't look in depth into queries like that. Well, let's walk people through a little bit. How hard is it to set up a company? Oh man! Oh, it's very easy to set up a company. A I mean, that's thirty-five dollars in machine. Yeah. I think about thirty-five dollars. Yeah. I mail it in. Yeah, yeah. Fax. I fax it in. I mean, you can just set up an S corp. I can set up this. Um, so oh, that my. that's step one. The next step is figure out who they use now. That's yeah. not hard to figure out either. Pu- publicly traded companies have a lot of documents online. Yep. Ten Ks, ten Qs actually list out how much they're willing to invest and how much they typically spend on certain services and certain things. You can see what their technology spend is pretty easily. I mean, even if you're just in the industry and you know people that work at these companies, they're pretty open about like who they go through as far as like VARs and, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's so, social engineering is really easy at that level because they never anticipate you, you know, obviously. assuming the identity of the people that they're buying the services right. from. I so, mean, but me personally, still seeing a request for 103 million, 123 million come across my desk. Even if it is from a name that I'm used to, I'm still going to double and triple check to make sure this is okay. 
Well, and I brought something similar up. I think I told you guys about the hardware scams with the recycling. Yep. Mm-hmm. One of the things that the recyclers had done and it appeared to make it confusing was they registered the name of their company in the same city as another company with the same name. Mm. So it made it very ambiguous and confusing because mm-hmm. they were in unrelated, somewhat related, but unrelated directly businesses, and they shared a company name. So which company was it? And when you Google it, it was funny because it made the local news of them, the, the other company being in the news going, it's not us. Quit asking. We're not involved in this scam thing going on. Right. And you can legally do that. Someone, You, you have to change things with the, the way the company rules work. So I register a DBA, and I can use DBAs that are similar to others. I just can't yes. register exactly the same company mm-hmm. name. But if you register it with a little slight variations or a misspelling, it's just like a phishing attack on a website where you have that targeted uh, cyber squatting attack where you misspell a company name mm-hmm. so it looks like it came from there. What was the name of the company? Quantum? Quantum. Quanta. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So change your company a little bit, just enough, and oh, okay. From Quantum with the U to Quantum with the it's O. Quanta. Yeah. That's the oh. name of the company that they deal with. So he Boom. just changed his to Quanta uh, so, with an extra A. Yeah. It's, it's a little unclear exactly how they pulled that part off, but it was... It, posing as another company, man, that's complete social engineering. You just set it all up. You build it all on there. Uh, what was that other uh, movie from a long time ago, Boiler Room, where they were doing all the fake stocks? Oh, yeah. It's the same concept. <laughs> I mean, these are social engineering. It's not like we're, we may be talking about how they got hacked in 2019, and we talk a lot of technical details, but this is why I said this guy over here at the end is a scary one because... Yeah, I mean, like, you know, um, the dude who destroyed those servers made no money and went to prison. Mm-hmm. And he just got sentenced. So... Um, you know these dudes who did the ransomware. I doubt they. I doubt they get paid, right? Even though the FBI just go go ahead and tells you you should just pay them for the data if you yeah. if you want to get your data back. Um, but yeah, I, I doubt they get paid. Someone's probably going to come out with an unlocker. Um, shameless plug here. I have a friend who <laughs> runs NoMoreRansom.org. If you are hit with the ransomware, go to NoMoreRansom.org. They will help you out. <laughs> There's probably an unlocker. Thank you, Ben Potter. Yeah, that's uh. A, a, uh craziness there yeah and to, just to deter the fishers and scammers this guy did get caught oh he did do get not caught. underestimate the power of google and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> they went to lithuania and got this man man yeah there's probably a companies if you not that i'm suggesting you ever hack anyone but dude, those are really awful ones like uh, yeah yeah there's general electric facebook google and then like all of the dot govs and dot mills that you just don't aim at Please. allegedly Please Allegedly. don't. And the reality of this, in the sad reality, I'll bring it back to the small business. We have we see this less. I know we hear about it from a surface level because it's not really a technical hack, but we just know because we deal with some of these companies. They've been scammed out of smaller amounts of money from these companies setting up looking like vendors. I talked before about the manufacturing company that was hit via email, scam. They did hack their email, but sometimes they don't even do that. They just send out invoices. Mm-hmm. So, and Low actually, tech. oh man, I wonder, you know what? He might be... Um, I. I have to dig up the details to see if I can turn it into the full story, but uh, copyrights on books. Hmm. The guys got greedy and made a few million dollars uh, selling copyrights on books. Wow. So my friend hmm. owns a publishing company, and like books, actual physical book publishing. Hmm. Book publishing is royalties paid out. Right. When the author dies, the royalties are no longer paid because the author dies, and then no one asks for royalties. The way the royalty system works is as long as the author's alive, he lets you know, and there's like a process. You re-sign up for another year of royalties. So these guys get this clever idea. People die. I'll just assume the royalties of dead people. And it's it's so <laughs> basic and stupid yeah, clever. They not, started that's invoicing. The of that's, not, that's not crazy me. hard. That's, that's interesting. Not, that is... And because they got greedy and someone noticed that books that, they're like, that guy died. What if he's paying royalties? Well, and it is true. Sometimes even after people die, the family may assume the royalties of it. Yeah. It may not necessarily go into public state. domain. Yeah. So they yeah, were but collecting. But if it's Dr. Seuss, like, come yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> and they got greedy is where it all went to wrong and everything else. But yeah, once again, complete social engineering. Someone just got this idea going, you know what no one does they don't collect on this and uh their entire company basis i think they were getting they got up to over two million a year only thing they had was a bunch of people and they got one of those giant machines that stuff envelopes and like that loaded the envelopes and just they pre-print and mail out bills to all the royalties and just contracts out all over the place to ones they didn't have the rights to but no one else did either so there wasn't like they would get it, it just it's so stupid <laughs> but it worked until they got caught 
because that is illegal, by the way. Oh, <laughs> We're laughing at it, not because they made money or we think no, it's... It, but it, because it, it's so silly that you paid out on these royalties. Yeah. That, that's why we're laughing and, about and it. And royalty payments are small on books. You don't get a ton per book. So it's right. you send it to all the different places to have the book in print. So it's a small amount of money. So it takes thousands of envelopes getting mailed out. But then cumulatively starts adding about a couple dollars here, $10 royalty here, $100 royalty there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. Oh, well, we'll leave you with that. If I can find the link to that, uh, their conviction, it would be fun because it was this happened a long time ago, but I just thought that was such a clever, basic, someone sat around and just kind of said, you know what we could do? And they were all four more people who worked in the publishing business that just got together to do this. <laughs> Intense. <laughs> yeah. There's a better audit system in place now for that, as he told me. But <laughs> wow. But it clearly wasn't for Facebook and Google, but um, yeah, the guy got greedy and got caught, so it's a horrible idea to do, and... Google, yeah, trying trying to go up those companies, man. Yeah, I'll bring you an update. The guy gets sentenced um, June twenty eighth. So okay, I'll bring you an update on his lengthy sentence, which I'm sure it will be. Looking forward to that. Yeah, it, and that's a nice thing. Once all this gets, uh, there's actually someone who goes by the title Skip Olivia. You can find him on my forums. He posts a lot of these things. Hi, because he's also send show notes here. <laughs> hey, uh, he uh, has done some legal research and things like that. Uh, I think he's got a blog, but there's links in my forums and he's posted some of these legal uh, debriefs because he takes the time to lead them. Because once these cases get out and finally get published and they get published in some of the uh, court papers, that's when people like that will go through and you get to read those technical details. And uh, we're going to u- we're going to be using more of that as some of our technical debrief on mm-hmm. uh, some of this because then you get all those juicy details like the court hearing that we read last week for how we know what happened over at um, Starwood. Like that's right. testimony. It becomes part of public record where right. we can pour through it and find out they got Papa Mimi cats. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All and right. also, they have yeah. Pie Pie Cats now. So oh. if you want to have a little fun at the office yeah. and want to, you know, violate a little uh, CFAA, <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> we didn't have time to cover because we didn't really get in depth on it, but we're working on, we have an interview we're going to be publishing to the channel yes. yep. um, with some hacker. Just some guy did a thing with a plane. <laughs> there you go. Some hacker, some guy. Did some guy did a thing with a plane, plane, if that's not enough clues. And trains. Oh, and trains. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And cars. And cars. So, uh, and ships. Stay on the lookout for <laughs> And apparently, uh, the future is going to be a, a brain, a he, human brain. Oh? Yeah. So, so he's going to move on from hacking transportation to moment <laughs> systems. <Yeah. laughs> because, well, actually, it looks like he's going to be doing a little bit more. Okay. Um, uh, of that in the airplane space now with the whole Boeing issue, uh, really relate relaying the the you know to to be honest with you guys, security is fun, cybersecurity is awesome, but really at the end of the day, it boils down to safety. Yeah. yeah. And the more and more of these things that we put online, the digital twins of the world. I used to work for General Electric. It's all about security because safety. Because we don't want PLCs to be blowing up plants, and you know we don't want gas, you know, gas tanks to be discharged, and yeah. we don't want trains to be sped up ever so much so that they fly off the tracks. Yeah. So, um, you know, security very much so is related to safety these days. Because those are turned yep. to real serious issues. Yes, yeah. and they have been How serious issues in the past. You know, I don't know if General Motors is, but I know uh, Ford is on Hacker One. GM is definitely okay, on Hacker GM One. Hacker One too. Yeah. Okay, they're they're actually doing a very very good job with responding to yeah. uh, vulnerabilities and bugs. Um, I, I remember being at GM when the Pwn Star thing happened, and uh, they responded immediately. And I actually worked on those systems, and they they took it very serious. So, uh, kudos to them. Uh, kudos to Tesla. Another really really yeah, uh, they're, they're working yeah, really yeah. hard to to make sure that we are safe and secure, and they they're owning every failure that they've had. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's good stuff. I mean, yeah, because yeah. car hacking is, uh, we, we've been having a lot of discussions about it because it's in its infancy. It's going to get, as cars get more complicated, we're going to see more car hacks. And Yeah, but, but but treat cars like locks. Never pick a lock that you need that's critical. Never hack a car <laughs> that you need to drive to work in. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't go well. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a really hard time to explain to the dealer why all of a sudden, um, you know, he can't even <laughs> reflash your computer because some reason. <laughs> well, Tesla has the beta sign up too. Uh, you can sign up to hack your Tesla. Uh, mm-hmm. They have a whole program. They have a program for bug bounties and everything that you sign up, and they can uh, offer you some like development modes of the car, and they'll even help you. They said as best to their abilities. Um, that one, you're not voiding your warranty. That's actually mm-hmm. something That's they state. Huge. They yeah. also say we'll help you reflash the firmware if you, uh, you know, end up stuck, not able to drive to work. So poor, poor Michigan because we don't have any dealerships, so you have to tow your car to Toledo. 
Is it the closest Tesla? I think uh, that's maybe awesome. A little, though, maybe a little, further. Maybe a little further. Maybe a little further. Cooperating with the public because they know people are going to hack it anyway. Yeah. So we might as well invite you to hack it with us, yep. and we can come up with better solutions together. Yep. Exactly. Check out Hacker One and stuff. All those, all those big companies are on there. It's pretty cool. Look what they're offering for some bug bounties. So yep. and yeah. come out to DC three one three. Yeah. This Wednesday when you watch this because it's it's coming out. Yeah. Uh, this Wednesday when you watch uh, or when you see this. Uh, this Wednesday, come on down to DC313, DC313.org. What date is that? That's the uh, 27th? It's going to be this Wednesday, the 27th. Okay. Um, I think it's the 27th. Yeah, 27th, Bamboo, Detroit. So if you're watching this after March 27th, there'll be another one. Check out DC313, and yeah. we'll leave links to all that. All right, We're thanks. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. See you later. All right, later. Later. Cool.